And uh, for anybody who is interested, or and probably many of you already know, uh, there is a, uh, a draft of this technical fix, a second technical fix work in progress uh, that is on the CaliforniaPrivacy.org uh, site. And this is uh, one of the two current bills that I'm aware of in the California legislature that are actually working to uh, working on uh, CCPA. Uh, the way that California legislature works is early on you can put in spot bills, uh, placeholders uh, that say that carve out a territory, but they do not necessarily have any actual useful legal language in them. And so, but we know that uh, Mr. Chow uh, is working on this bill. That's the draft that's on uh, uh, the California Privacy dot org site. He was the it, sponsor it, of the legislation. Pardon? He was the sponsor. He was the, one of okay. uh, one of them. Yeah. It was Chow, Dodd, and Hertzberg were the the three main legislators, okay. uh, but. Uh, so they, they have taken steps, and I don't know if, if uh, Jordan or Neil have had a chance to look at the, uh, the, that set of technical amendments, but uh, we think that's going to address some solid fraction of the concerns that the business community has. Obviously not all, and we'll keep talking, but, um, but we're, it's definitely a work in progress, and there is a lot of, of intent within the legislature to, uh, to move forward with that. So Neil, you are both a an attorney and uh, have a background in computer science. That's correct. Do you look at the process of uh, writing the law in California and the complexities and some of the amb ambiguities and vagueness and I think frankly messiness of the process, and take it away from that that it's maybe just too difficult to write legislation and regulation around topics privacy, particularly when it's uh, in the online space. Well, I do think there is a big challenge around privacy in particular. I think legislation obviously can happen. Um, it happens best, and it gets the, we get the clearest and uh, uh, clearest results when people agree on what the problem is first, as a first step. And I think here, um, we've heard different versions of what, I was on a panel recently, and, and it was on privacy legislation. And we, within five minutes, we had talked about ID theft, um, misinformation campaigns, uh, election manipulation, um, and online advertising. Those are radically different issues. And, and so I think part of the challenge is <clears throat> coming out with a solution to a problem that people don't agree on yet. People don't agree what the problem is. And so in that situation, I think it's very hard to write legislation. And it's especially hard if you have already have a thing that is there, and there's ambiguities in it, and you're trying to distill them down. Um, if people have different views of what the problem is. And so it's not a surprise to me that this, is, this was the end result of the, the CCPA negotiation, was that people kind of threw their hands up and said, there's ambiguities here. We're going to have to figure it out later, it, in part because they didn't even agree on what the problem was. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> but Neil, what I mentioned before, we started by thinking exactly and answering that exact question, what is the problem? And the problem is businesses are collecting so much personal information and we don't know what they're collecting. And right now, there isn't a framework to find out. And so that's why there has to be a legislative fix so that you know, we can truly consent to use a service. Because right now, you click to agree to accept a terms of service and to, that you read a policy, privacy policy. And even if you did, you don't learn anything from that. Yeah, I, I agree that that's, that is one view of what the problem is. And I think that I, I, take, you, I take you at face value that that was the problem that you identified. I think many other people, when they talk about privacy, they talk about other things. And so when you pull consumers, the things that they're typically most worried about is ID theft and credit card fraud. Um, that's not, in fact, credit card Actually, fraud. Actually, we did pull consumers. Yeah. And they, they were worried about that their personal information and yeah. just the extent of, sure. the, government, of the surveillance. But, but things like ID fraud and uh, ID theft and, and credit card fraud you can actually solve some of those problems by companies collecting more data. In fact, that's that's how fraud prevent or fraud prevention works. And so, so which is I, why there's saying, a carve right. out for fraud prevention. And and sure. also remember the CCPA, the the foundation of it is a, a business can collect as much information as they want to. They can use it internally. They can use it for contextual advertisements. There's they can use it for fraud detection. There's a whole series of business purposes that we actually came up with meeting with private companies. Last fall, we met with Microsoft and Apple and Facebook and Google and 
everybody hated the law, but they still gave, gave us some meaningful <laughs> feedback. And, and one of it was data is, there are very, there are really good uses of the information and that we needed to protect consumers, which we 100% agree with. And that foundation is still there in the CCPA. Yeah, when you look at some of the policy proposals floating around Washington right now, like Senator Rubio has a bill, Senator Markey, I'm sure people can name the other folks that have uh, introduced proposals, are those similarly too broad? Uh, so I haven't looked at ev every single bill, and, okay. and actually I, I don't really want to comment on specific legislation, um, <laughs> part of not, not the hat I'm wearing right here. Um, but uh, uh, some of them are. Some of them are more targeted. And so, um, so we've, we've seen in the, in the past, a, an example of targeted legislation would be uh, legislation that addresses data breach notification, right? Everybody kind of agrees on what the problem is there. And they can write something that everybody, people might disagree on what the solution is, but they kind of agree on what the problem is. People don't know about these data breaches, or uh, alternatively, when they do know about them, they're, he they're hearing about them at different times, and they're not getting good information about what they can do to, to act on that. So, so um, that's, an, that's a more narrow solution, or that's a more narrow problem that people agree on, and that leads to more targeted legislation. If, if you start with the problem being that companies have too much data, um, that right there, you're, you're setting yourself up for a, a fight. I would prefer we start with consumers are being injured this way. What is the injury that's, that's happening to consumers? Let's focus on that. Then we might be able to focus on how we fix that specific problem. So ID theft, or it, even if we're talking about uh, consumers are losing autonomy or things like that, if we can figure out what the key problem is, or set of problems, then we can target legislation to that. Okay. Um, you mind? Yes, please. So one of the things that you know this this panel is ostensibly talking both about CCPA and uh, the GDPR, mm -hmm. uh, and I I want to 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 raise that point that out because this is part of the background uh, in which you have to understand the entire current. Uh, thinking and popular ad people's actual attitudes about uh, data privacy, about data protection, is being, has been influenced by the fact of GDPR, uh, by debates over broadband privacy, uh, and by the Cambridge Analytica uh, debacle. So in, it is one thing to talk sort of abstractly or economically about this uh, notion of harm, but I think we also have to be very we have to accept that the reality, which is that consumers now have a much more complicated, I think, uh, attitude towards the prop, what the problem is. We, I will agree with you that there are that it has many, many dimensions. Uh, but I think that it is also quite true that, uh, as a political matter, I don't mean political enough partisan political matter, as a matter of political reality, the consumers that we interact with, the, the surveys you get, you're seeing not only this, these issues of specific harms that somebody had their ID stolen, but also these much broader issues of, as, as Mary said, the, do the companies have too much? Do we trust them? with that. We know there can be consequences when our data is being misused. And uh, whatever sorts of trust that consumers may have had in the past uh, with respect to those kinds of uh, corporate collections of information, it's definitely taken a major hit in the last few years. And a lot of this is simply you know, responding to that political reality. And the GDPR is, you know, one of the things that's really interesting now is that we're seeing both of both the California law and the GDPR are not sectoral. They're relatively omnibus and uh, comprehensive, right? They're not of the where well, we're going to do HIPAA uh, for health. We're going to do GLB. Uh, we're going to do FCRA. It's not uh, sectoral because one of the effects of technology in the current environment is that it busts through those kinds of sectoral. Uh, lines and when you have laws that were originally, say, framed around particular covered entities, mm -hmm. you know, and then because of innovation, we find that companies that are completely outside that sector are also able to collect that information or even, even if not collect it, infer 
that kind of information from other information, then people begin to have understood, I think, that, oh, the threats cannot be analyzed sector by sector. We have to have a more sort of comprehensive uh, look at privacy. Yeah. I sometimes wonder what this debate would look like if Facebook weren't a thing or Cambridge Analytica never happened. It seems like the contours would We be might not be having pretty, it. Yes, I think that, that might be true. Uh, so, um, Jordan, one of the uh, big points of debate in D.C. around a p possible federal privacy set of rules is uh, this question of preemption, whether a federal law would override individual state laws like California's. The chamber, I believe, has come out and said that they, they're a, a fan of, pre any sort of, any, of preemption and any sort of uh, set of rules that might come out. Why not leave this to the states? California went through this pretty you know, complicated process to come up with their own rules. Why, why not leave it to them? Um, I, the simple answer is the data is everywhere. And when we're dealing with the issue of data and transmitting data across state lines, you don't really have a more interstate issue than data and the analytics of it, the processing of it, the transferring of it uh, across state lines. Uh, I, I think, you know, in terms of what the chamber would like to see is we would like to make sure that there's certainty. And I think that's, you know, Neil, you're talking about what, what the problem is there. You know, I think part of the problem is there's uncertainty on the part of both consumers and the business community. Uh, consumers don't know what kind of tangible rights, especially even outside of California, what their rights are, are with regard to privacy. Um, you know, we believe in it, you know, we've filed comments with the FTC and NTIA uh, stating that we think that consumers should have tangible protections and, and, and rights with regard to personal information. And they need to know who to go to for enforcement. They need to know what the rules of the road are. At the same time, the business community, uh, we believe, needs to also have certainty. And I think our concern, you know, as I said, there are good parts to California. There are bad parts to California, in our, our opinion. Um, our concern is what we're seeing on uh, the state level in other states. Washington State has a law uh, or, or a proposed bill that looks very much like GDPR right now. Hawaii has a bill. New Mexico has a bill. Um, you know, and as we see states kind of start to take up their own uh, version of what they think a solution to privacy should be, we think that just creates confusion for both consumers and for, for businesses. And that's why we think that preemption is, is the best solution and having one and national uh, framework for privacy that actually has legitimate teeth to it, um, that isn't just self-reg. Uh, that is something that actually does have real meaningful protection for consumers. And, and we think in the end that the federal solution provides both clarity and certainty to both consumers and to the business community as is well. Is preemption a deal breaker for the chamber? That's, that's what we'll be seeking. Uh, that's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, if I could comment on the preemption issue? Yes. So, so I, uh, I would commend to people, um, Professor Peter Swire had a very nice two-parter. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the I, that is on the IAPP uh, website discussing a lot, uh, doing a really a, a pretty good dive into the preemption issue. And one of the things, uh, you know, part one of that uh, discussion points out that there are many uh, privacy statutes that the fed, federal government has enacted uh, over the years that will set a federal floor, a baseline of protection, but do not unduly limit the states in being able to have uh, more stringent uh, protection. So for instance, HIPAA sets a federal floor that has, does, did not preempt uh, the uh, California's Confidentiality of Medical Information Act. Um, you know, the Wiretap Act uh, protects the uh, privacy of people's communications, uh, and yet uh, many states have actually have protections that are uh, different and stronger. You know, California is a two-party consent state, whereas the federal uh, standard is one-party consent. Uh, so, so the idea that you have to uh, preempt the states completely has not in the past been actually the, the major uh, theory of federal privacy legislation. The second point uh, in part two of his uh, discussion is really pointing out all sorts of really interesting and good, I think, uh, operational issues with how you scope preemption out to the states, because there are many, many existing laws that uh, if you look at them, you probably wouldn't want to have uh, preempted. So uh, you know, obviously, preemption is going to be a hotly debated issue. Uh, but it's, it's my sense that it's actually, it's actually a pretty complicated and uh, sophisticated one that involves a lot of choices that uh, people, I think, uh, you know, haven't yet really grappled with. So as Neil said, it depends what you mean by privacy, and you would add, it depends what you mean by preemption. 
Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mary, you mentioned meeting with the Internet Association, uh -huh. some other tech groups, tech companies to discuss uh, putting together the rules in California. And you mentioned that everyone hated the, the sort of uh, the, the what you ended up with. What advice would you give to lawmakers here in Washington who are going through the process of uh, coming up with the policy proposals about how do you engage in Silicon Valley and with these companies? You know, I think the tide is turning, especially there will be, the CCPA is coming into effect in a year in California. So I think that everybody right now is trying to get their voice out there. So I think it's listening, but it's also figuring out what are those core principles that you really care about. And then um, I think the other piece of it is making sure, besides there has to be strong enforcement, but also making sure that the ultimate law becomes a living law. Because you don't want to, we wrote the CCPA in 2017, but we were very mindful that we didn't want to write a law that was only good for whatever technology was used in 2017. So we empower the AG to update the definition of personal information and update some other definitions. So similarly, on a federal level, I think the FTC would have to be empowered to write rules to update the law. OK, how do you work with a, uh, just one, with a Google, Facebook, other companies that might have a vested interest in this topic to convince them to see things your way, or just the well, sort of like nuts and bolts of the, the I think I think they're convinced. I mean, everybody's yeah. out here with a bill. Like Facebook, a year ago, was shopping around a bill in Sacramento. It's not. It's it's. They're here. They're okay. they're not going away. And and I mean, you know, what we heard early on before Cambridge Analytica happened was, oh well, you know, you don't have to worry so much about the tech companies because they don't really have a lot of lobbyists. They don't play in <laughs> politics. <laughs> But it was, it's AT&T and Comcast. AT&T and Comcast have bought out Sacramento, so it's the telecoms you have to be worried about. And like, clearly, times have changed. <laughs> That's pretty good. Neil, you had? Yeah, I was just going to chip in on the idea of flexibility. There's lots of ways to get to flexibility. Rulemaking authority isn't the only one. And in fact, the FTC's current Section 5 enforcement is a great example of flexibility. If you have an outcome-driven uh, standard, which is you know don't deceive consumers and don't treat them unfairly, then the commission can adapt uh, its approach when it sees new facts, when it sees new harms that are happening to consumers, and that is a that is another way of flexibility. Rulemaking isn't the only way that you can be flexible in these, and and the FTC has has proven that by using Section Five over the last twenty five years to to bring hundreds of privacy related cases. Okay, and I actually don't. Question for you, Neil. Switching gears a little bit, we've given Europe a little bit of short shrift. Uh, how do we know GDPR is about eight months old? Um, how do we know whether it's been? Do we know yet if it's successful or not? Uh, I, I don't think we do know yet. I mean, um, there's some early studies about uh, investment. They're you know they're short term. There's some evidence that it's having side effects that aren't necessary. It depends on how you judge successful. You'll hear this a lot from me. It depends. <laughs> you are uh, a lawyer. <laughs> maybe I should be an economist. I think that's more of an economist thing. Um, uh, but um, uh, so if you're judging GDPR just by privacy outcomes, I, I don't know. I, it would be interesting to ask that question. If you judge it by some other outcomes, because privacy isn't the only thing that consumers care about, um, we've seen some changes in market share uh, for advertisers in the EU. And I think they, they were predicted that the big guys would be able to comply with this better and the small guys wouldn't. And so market share would move to the big guys. So if you have concerns about those types of issues, uh, you might judge GDPR as having some problems. Um, if you have concerns about in, in, uh, innovation in Europe or investment in innovation in Europe, some early preliminary data suggests that GDPR might have some problems. Um, so we'd, we'd want to think about how to measure privacy outcomes. What does that look like? Does it look like fewer data breaches? Does it look like fewer uh, you know, stalking incidents? I, I, that's, we, if we boil it down to the consumer harm, that's, that's how I would want to measure its success. How, how has this law made consumers' lives better? Mm -hmm. And I don't think we know that yet for GDPR, but I do think it's a really important question to ask. Okay. This is sort of a jump ball question for anyone. The, uh, it's possible that Europeans and Californians have a more robust sense of personal privacy than Americans. This is a hypothesis I'm floating. You can, it's completely wrong. A more robust sense of uh, the personal privacy that they want to have protected in their lives and the, you know, the non-California part of the United States. Are, um, is that 
is there too much uh, or too many lessons being learned from California and Europe in the sort of national policy making that's going on in Washington right now? We're sort of overlearning some of the lessons from other places that have a sort of different expectation of privacy. Can I jump in again? Okay, but then yeah, quick, and then I'll yeah. Uh, just really quick. Um, in part because of the reasons uh, that Mary mentioned, uh, I don't think that the California law necessarily represents the impulses of the California people. So I don't know that on that case that it's a particularly good example of different preferences in California compared to the US. Europe is a different story. Europe does have a different set of ideas about privacy. And most importantly, they don't have the First Amendment. And so um, privacy and uh, and freedom of speech run into each other. Uh, and in the US, negotiating that has been challenging. And I think that they will continue to run into each other. At some point, my ability to control uh, what you observe and think about me runs into free speech. And, and uh, I think we're going to have to figure that out. Um, and I think it means that in Europe, they can do things that I, I, they are doing things because their value systems are different on that point uh, than the US. And so. Um, it's probably a suggestion that GDPR may not be a perfect, I mean, we shouldn't take that model whole hand because we have other values like free speech that matter a lot in the US. And I'm gonna take the ball too. I, um, I agree with you about that. And that's why um, yes. we, <laughs> <laughs> we of course looked at GDPR and um, took elements of it, but because of the First Amendment framework in the United States, there were things that we didn't do. Um, including, and Lee and I had disagreements over this, but the part of the reason why the privacy advocacy community wasn't completely supportive of the initiative is that we had an opt out for the sale of personal information. And so we got a lot of pushback by the privacy advocates that they wanted an opt in. But because of I'm the. Sorry to interrupt, but just oh, so people have to proactively say. <laughs> yes, so you can't it's, have a, it's affirmative consent. So before a business could sell your personal information, you would have to say like, okay, you can sell my personal information and instead of the other way around. And um, so what we, you know, we were really worried because it's not just the consumer's First Amendment rights that we took into consideration when drafting the law, but it was also the corporation's First Amendment rights. And, I, and then going back to your original question though, I don't think that privacy is something that only Europeans care about or only Californians care about. This is, it's a basic human right. It's the right to control your own personal information. And I think that's why there really does need to be a national standard. Okay. You mind if I jump in? Can you, I'm so sorry. No, I just want to say one thing very quickly. We're going to take audience questions in a second, so if people can be thinking about what they might want to ask. Yeah. So, so first of all, you know, there are clearly, um, you know, for the overall question, I think that the jury is completely <laughs> out on the, the efficacy, shall we say, of either CCPA or GDPR. It is far, far too early to tell. And indeed, in trying to evaluate these things, we really just, it's, it's, I think it's impossible as a practical matter to evaluate it in the first few years because in, and it will be also similarly impossible for CCPA because we will be working through what it means Right, there, right now in the EU, there's quite a bit of, of, one might say, impact litigation, as well as DPA action uh, of the enforcement type, which is- So those are the, I'm sorry, those are the data protection authorities. That's right, that's right, where they are finding violations, and then the companies are going to uh, challenge those findings, and through the courts or what the administrative process will get a better idea of what it means, say, to have consent in the EU. That is something that uh, uh, activists like Max Schrems have particular views about, and the companies have particular views about. And the language of the GDPR does not is not self-interpreting, in and and issues like that. I mean, one of the reasons why I don't why I accept ambiguity in these kinds of statutes uh, is because at the end of the day, you have to work them out in concrete situations to really understand what they mean. I mean, you know, you could, to use an example from the Fourth Amendment, you can say reasonable expectation of privacy, but you don't know what it means until you look at the cases. Or you can say probable cause, but who knows what probable cause means. You cannot reduce it 
to You're a, making my argument for the advantages of Section 5. Well, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with enforcement as a, as a means of regulation, but there's also nothing wrong with using rulemaking. They're both there. Uh, I want them both as part of the toolkit. Uh, and t the, right now, one of the problems that the FTC has is it only doesn't have all of the tools it needs. Uh, so, you know, one of the issues is going to, for federal legislation is going to be what are you actually going to do in terms of giving uh, the whatever agency has this power, you know, the uh, resources, uh, the technical competence, uh, and the, you know, uh, a process framework uh, by which it's going to actually look at this, these things. And that's one of the weaknesses I see in CCPA compared to uh, the GDPR, which is that the GDPR has some very very clear grants of affirmative investigatory power given to the DPAs. Yeah. Whereas, unfortunately, we're, you know, the California AG's office, you know, it has a kind of DPA-like responsibility for oversight, but it's not at all clear what its powers are going to be, yeah. um, you know, say, to march into a company and actually take a look at what's going on. So yeah. there are uh, all sorts of really interesting accountability and, uh, investigatory aspects of uh, GDPR that are worth considering when you look at what a, uh, you know, a U.S. framework might want to adopt. Okay, excellent. And uh, do we have a microphone to go around? Is that, okay, excellent. Let's go right up here. Thank you. And if you can just identify yourself, yes. And if your affiliation is relevant, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Robert Winston from uh, NetChoice. Uh, my question is, um, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like there's uh, people aren't really sure about what the impact of the California bill will be next year if there is no preemption, if it is allowed to go ahead. I think a lot of people are saying we don't know what it's going to do to small businesses. We don't really know what it's going to do to startups and even the big businesses sometimes. And uh, if that's the case and there is such uh, unpredictable, like if it is so unpredictable and things could really go bad for a lot of businesses around the, the country and for the digital economy, is it really wise that we let it go ahead without preempting it first? I feel like you might have an answer to that yourself. <laughs> <laughs> sort of implied in the question. Okay, we're going can to... I, can I bank shot off of that just for a second? To Very address briefly. Something? Um, yeah. uh, there are some things we know about GDPR's effects, and that's that coming into compliance with it is really expensive. Um, there's probably some people in this room that earn their paychecks uh, complying with it. And so we know there are some costs. We don't have a very good handle on what the benefits are. Um, we have another question? Yeah, over the stripes over there. <laughs> Martin Bach, Inside Cybersecurity. To the extent that data privacy equals data protection, specifically, um, how do the panelists feel about uh, international law imposing security requirements for third parties as opposed to leaving it up to a contractual agreement between the primary and uh, ter third party. All right, I guess it's secondary. So that was that issue in the Cambridge Analytica case, right? It wasn't so much it was the, the Facebook's relationship with the third party vendor. Well, and I, I think part of the problem right now is, is you as the consumer, you have no idea who those third party vendors are. So the only way for you to secure that information is to trust the first party to impose requirements on whoever they're transferring it to, to use it responsibly. Anyone else? I would say I agree that transparency is a solution to a lot of these issues. And, and knowing where data is going and who is using it is important to consumers. And I think that that will play a great role in protecting consumers as we move forward. What's the chamber's view and how well the industry, the tech industry online platform sort of sub-industry has done on that front on transparency and data security within the last few years? Uh, I mean, I think obviously there are some bad actors that are out there uh, right now. I mean, I think overall we believe that the business community does a good job at being transparent and also uh, implementing good security measures as well too. But, you know, as we've discussed today though, I mean, we want to make sure that consumers have that added backstop of, of confidence uh, by having federal legislation that would pr pr offer protections to them as well, too. So 
while there are bad actors out there, we want to make sure that there's some teeth out there for, for groups like the FTC to go after truly bad actors. And and I'm sorry. Oh, well, I was just th saying that this is kind of the, the, it's data minimization, right? You want to nudge companies to not collect all the possible information that they possibly can right now, because they can, and it's cheap to hold on to it. But do you want to say, like, OK, there's actually a cost. If you're the flashlight app, I don't want to find out that you're collecting all my geolocation information so, and then selling it. And so I think that inherently, if companies are collecting less personal information, then there's less information out there to be stolen. Okay. Um, do we have another question? Yeah, right up front here. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Zimmerman with NCTA. So I have a question. I mean, we've, I guess, obliquely touched on the possibility of federal legislation, but I'm just wondering if folks can handicap uh, whether we might see, you know, yeah, you can never take a bet on whether Congress will act, but maybe the factors this year are between Cambridge Analytica, CCPA, GDPR, other state action. We meant, you mentioned the Rubio bill, the Markey, CDT has a bill, Intel has a bill. I know there's other efforts going on at coming up with consensus frameworks and privacy legislation. Anyone want to take a stab at talking about federal legislation? Sure, sure. Um, I think Senator Wicker, there uh, was a story in BuGov last night talking about his view that the next two years are really the sweet spot to get something done in terms of federal legislation. Um, you know, I think this is the first time in a while in D.C. that all sides, Democrats and Republicans, agree that something needs to be done uh, about uh, data privacy on a federal level. Once again, the question is bridging the gap uh, as to what the, the details of that are. I mean, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll say this from, from our experience of the chamber. Um, you know, we released privacy principles back in September, and that was the effort of, of nearly 200 companies and trade associations that have not agreed in the past on many issues, uh, whether it be data breach, whether it be even privacy, but we've come together because I think we realize that this is the time to really get something done. And I think as, you know, kind of putting my attorney hat on is that, you know, we don't usually get things done in this town unless we have a deadline to meet. And I think last month was also, you know, indicative of that with things in DC. And I think California provides kind of a, a goalpost to look at or a, a shot clock in a way for many uh, legislators on the Hill to really say, let's try to get something done before then. Um, you know, I, I'm more optimistic this year than in previous years that we can get something done, but I think now is probably the best time to try to get something done. Well, uh, just to piggyback a little bit, we did a lot of internal polling because the initiative process itself is a, is, it's a campaign. And so what we found is privacy is, it's not a liberal or a conservative issue. It, it was equal. It, Republicans and Democrats care about privacy. And so that's why that in combination with California is coming into effect in a year. I mean, I think there's no time like the present. And I, I would say, I, I think if the parties who are working on this narrow it to the issues that, I think we can find common ground on what are the harms we're trying to prevent here. And I think if we start there, we, I think Congress will get somewhere. Um, if they don't, we'll end up with a bill that is full of intentional vagueness um, because that's the only way people could agree uh, to get something done. And I, I don't know that, that that result is what we want. I think Congress should do the hard work to figure out what problem we're actually trying to solve. But so so I, I would actually say, and this ties back to, uh, to your question, I mean, think, I think that there is just a, there is a practical real world limit to how much you can assess and evaluate ahead of time. Uh, so, you know, you, you know, knew what my answer was going to be to the simple question, shouldn't we wait for, or shouldn't we have preemption and wait to see? Uh, and the fact is, I think you can't. You have to, you have to actually act, and then we have, to, but then I am under no illusions that when the California legislature uh, finishes its process, and assuming that the governor signs it, that there won't be a, a court challenge, say, to the California law. Um, I would bet good money that there, that, that will happen. Uh, and so as a practical matter, you will not necessarily see it go into effect right away. Another important point about the California law, of course, is that unlike the GDPR, it only applies to uh, commercial 
entities, and it contains uh, some size and business line thresholds, um, which may not stay where they are right now, but there was a, a, an intent uh, by the drafters to not have it apply willy-nilly to, to everyone, whereas the, uh, the GDPR is a little broader in scope. Uh, it includes nonprofits. It doesn't have a, a specific size uh, or revenue type requirements. And, and these are important issues in, in how we want to think about uh, the effects on small companies. Uh, and you know, we don't know uh, how that's uh, all going to play out. Now, I think it's the next panel that's actually be talking mm -hmm. more about the, uh, the one point I would add to, to what they've been saying about the prospects is that I don't think you can isolate the privacy aspects, uh, the privacy issues, from the more general issues of what is the role of government and regulation with respect to the, the tech companies, right? We have seen that uh, the questions about uh, fake news, Russian influence, um, about the size and antitrust and competition, they're all swirling around in this space. Uh, and you know the FTC right now, which also has antitrust authority, is looking at how do we say, how do we think about mergers? How do we think about acquisitions? How do we think about um, concentration? So it is not just privacy in terms of consumer harm. It's also there is a dimension of of at least economic power, uh, and to some extent the you know the so democracy effects are also you know political power that are being uh, being sort of tossed into a mix, which I think make it a very, I mean, really complicated uh, political issue. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, going back to your other point, that it's, it doesn't stifle innovation. In fact, there's a lot of companies, well, two things. One, there's lots of companies cropping up now that are offering new privacy products. And there's social networks that don't sell information and don't advertise. And then also, like coming going back to Silicon Valley, there are lots of startups there that absolutely hate Facebook. There's lots of people in the tech community there because the platforms are so big that it stifles innovation because it crushes the ability of new companies to generate unless they're on the Facebook platform. Lightning round to wrap up. Unfortunately, we're out of time. <laughs> I'm going to be even I'm going to be much more simplistic about this. The odds that we see meaningful federal privacy legislation before CCPA kicks in next January. Jordan. Uh, I would say better than we would have seen for privacy legislation <laughs> last year. <Okay. laughs> well punted. I'll say 10%. Uh, 10%. Wow. That's not a lot. OK. Excellent. I'll agree with him. OK. Mary? I'm going to be more optimistic, 50%. 50? OK, excellent. Thank you all so much. Thank you, uh, Mary, Lee, Neil, Jordan. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And uh, it seems like we're going to have a very robust year of privacy conversation. So I hope we can keep all this uh, conversation going. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.